time to study. And I thought to read and to seek the Lord for a heart. Last night I ever had the opportunity uh, to um, I had the opportunity to go to someone's home and to visit uh, with uh, somebody involved in uh, ch children's ministry. And uh, have a little baby. You know, I think she's uh, six weeks old. Little baby. And uh, something about a uh, little baby that God always speaks to my heart. Uh, because as we look at one another, we see each other as full grown, you know, but <clears throat> before the Lord, each one of us are children, you know, we're his children. And he cares for us. And I was holding that little child, you know, and the, the feelings of care and of uh, covering and wanting to protect and wanting to watch out for. And uh, those are the feelings of God towards us mm. when he looks at us. He does not look at us as uh, with, with consternation or anger, he looks at us as his children. And he cares for us that way. And uh, that's what the psalmist wrote in one of the psalms. He says, God remembers what we're made of. He remembers that we're but dust. And he remembers that we are, we are fragile. We really don't. Have, we like to think of ourselves as, you know, strong and mighty. And in some ways, the human being is an amazing uh, creation of God, and it can endure many things. But at the same time, we are easily taken out. And we are e we are weak. I remember years ago going to. Uh, you know, I was living in New York, and I went to visit uh, uh, one of the Teen Challenge graduates. Or, in the hospital, and he was taken out by a, by an illness. And as he laid in the bed, he was actually a guy that probably in his uh, his day of his strength could have swung me around like a sack of potatoes on his back. He was a strong, stout man, a man of great strength. But there he was, as weak as a baby, in that in that instance. And and so. We need Amen. the covering of the Lord. Yes. Amen. We need the protection of God. Yes. We yes. need His care for us. Yes. Because um, we just do. And when we humble ourselves and take that place, um, the Bible speaks about God drawing near to me. There are things that I can do that can attract God. And then there are things that I can do that can repel Him. And so as I draw near to the Lord, He draws near to me. And uh, it was just a wonderful experience. I think I've got Hebrews chapter 1. The book of Hebrews. The book of Hebrews is the only anonymous book in the New Testament. And we, we don't know who the author is. There are some who think they know. And maybe even have some good arguments. Some think it was the Apostle Paul. Others think he was Apollos. And then we'll all get into all those arguments here today. But God knows who wrote the book. He knows who the author is. And ultimately, the author was the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is the author of the scriptures. And he used human beings as his vessels, his instruments through whom he wrote it. Uh, but this writing speaks to a group of people who were alive 
at the time of the writings of the scriptures. We know that in the beginning, the early church, the first century church, was made up of all Jewish believers before Pentecost. And in many places, until the gospel started being preached and they were sent out, uh, really through the process of persecution, persecution came on the church and they were scattered to the four winds and began to preach the gospel. And we, uh, we see Peter preaching at the house of one man in chapter 10 of Acts, and we see Gentiles beginning to come in. But in the early days of the church, the church was made up of Jewish people. Jesus was Jewish. The apostles, all the authors of the scriptures, except for Luke, are, are uh, Jewish. And so there were many uh, people coming to Christ and because they had come to Christ, they were experiencing persecution, just like other believers all over the world were experiencing persecution. But these Jewish believers were also experiencing persecution at this time in the world because the Roman Empire uh, had kind of turned and focused on the Jewish people to persecute them as well. Um, and then there was another layer of persecution coming on them in their personal lives because in many parts of the world, um, when a person turns to Christ, and this is true in many Muslim nations as well, uh, and other religions, when people turn to Christ, they not only turn to Jesus, but in many places they are then rejected by their families and by their own culture. And so these folks were turning to Jesus and they were experiencing persecution from the Romans. They were experiencing persecution as Christians. And now they were being persecuted because it, within their own families and their own people because they had turned to Christ and had in the minds of their families had turned away from Judaism and the Old Testament law and so they were seen as traitors and turning their back and the persecution was very harsh many of them lost their homes they lost their belongings some of them lost their lives and they decided to think within themselves you know I wasn't bargaining for this when I gave my life to Jesus. Um, I'm going to go back to Judaism. I'm going to go back to the synagogue. And I'm going to go back to the ways of my fathers. And I'm, I'm not so sure I want to follow this Jesus. Um, and the writer of Hebrews writes to these people to let them know, wait a minute. <coughs> And, and that's why there's so much reference to the Old Testament in the book of Hebrews, because he's showing them that Jesus is the fulfillment of everything that they were taught in the Old Testament. And there's nothing to go back to, because now God is speaking to the world through and in the person of the Lord Jesus Christ, that he is the message of God, he's God's messenger, and he has the message, and that message is the gospel, the good news. So it's all fulfilled in Jesus, and they don't need to go back. Let's read chapter one. God, who at various times and various ways spoke in times past to the fathers by the prophets, has in these last days spoken to us by his son. We could probably spend the next half hour right here. Because he's saying here that God has spoken to the world in times past in many different ways. What are some of the ways that God spoke to the fathers in the past? Anyone? What are some of the ways that God spoke? Anyone? Through dreams? Yes. Gave Daniel dreams and visions? Yeah. What are some of the other ways that he spoke? Angels. 
Through angels? Amen. Through angels? Through a burning bush? Through a burning bush. Yes. And he spoke through prophets. Prophets. Moses. Daniel. Ezekiel. Jeremiah. Now when you think of these prophets, you think of, let's say the Lord. And uh, you think of judgment, yes. You think of judgment, you think of warning. You think of the law. He spoke through the law. But the writer of Hebrews is saying, that's how God has spoken to us in the past. These are the different messengers that God used to speak to the world. But in the last days, now, God is speaking to us through His Son, through Jesus. Amen. Through Jesus. Those prophets and those messengers serve their generation and they serve the purpose of God for that season. But now, that's old, that's behind us, that's the Old Testament, that's the Old Covenant. And it served its purpose and we respect it and we can learn from it and we study it because we see in the Old Testament Jesus is concealed. He's hidden. But when we come to the New Testament, we see all of these things that are written in the Old Testament, we see them fulfilled in Christ. And so now God is speaking to us through Jesus. He says, in these last days, has spoken to us by His Son, whom He has appointed to be the heir of all things, through whom also he made the world, who being the brightness of his glory and express image of his person and upholding all things by the word of his power, when he had himself purged our sins, sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high, having become so much better than the angels, as he by inheritance has obtained a more excellent name than they. So the apostle is saying here, we're going to look at these verses, and we're going to look at Jesus for the next few moments, because God is saying that he is speaking to us, to the world, through Jesus. Who is this Jesus that he's speaking to us through? This one that we call the Son of God. How do we know that He is who He said He was? How do we know that we have the truth? How do I know that this is the Word of the Lord and that the book, that the, uh, the Quran is not the Word of God? How do I know that these other religious books and writings in ancient times aren't the Word of God? Other religions claim to have the Word of God. But we have this, this collection of writings, and he has spoken to us through Jesus. He says here, number one, he has appointed him to be the heir of all things. That means that Jesus owns everything. He owns everything. He will inherit the nations. He will inherit the world. He will inherit everything. Why? Because he came into the earth. He left his glory in ages past. He left his honor and he left his name and his title and he became one of us. He came and he lived among us. And these men were eyewitnesses of that fact. They saw his life, they heard his messages, they saw the miracles he did, and they saw what? He said, well, the resurrection. They saw the resurrection. They saw this same man who walked with them for three years, 
and they saw him that healed the sick. They saw him nailed to the cross, and they saw him die. They saw him laid in the tomb, and he laid in there for three days and three nights, and they saw him raised from the dead. He is the heir of all things because he submitted himself to the will of God. He said yes to God to the point of being nailed to a cross. He laid everything down and said, yes, Father, I submit myself to your will. And God has now exalted him and given him a name above every name. That at the name of Jesus, every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that he is Lord to the glory of God the Father. And he is the heir of all things. Not by taking them by force, they have been given to him. Because he willingly laid them down. Amen. He willingly laid it down, laid it all down and came to pay the price for you and for me so that you and I could be saved. And there was no guarantee because he was tempted like all, at all points just like you and I are. And he could have failed. He could have sinned. He could have said no, but he didn't. He said yes to God. He said no to sin and to the devil. He said no to his own will and his own flesh. And he said yes to God's will. He said yes to the cross. He said yes to the grave. And God said, because you did that, son, I'm giving you everything. He is my kingdom. You're the heir of all things. He is the heir. So he's not just the heir of all things. through whom also he made the world, who being the brightness of his glory and the express image of his person. That's verse 3. That word image is the word, the Greek word for character. It's the same word that Jesus used when he spoke to the apostles and they, and they asked him, is it lawful to, to pay taxes? And the Pharisees came and said, is it lawful to pay tribute to Caesar or not? And he said to them, give me a coin. Whose image is on the coin? It's the same word. Whose character? It's, it's the, the, uh, the idea of an imprint being made by a die, cast by a die on a coin. Paul, or the, I, I believe, the, I guess I tip my hand, I believe Paul read wrote Hebrews, the apostle is saying that Jesus was the exact image of God. And he's making that point because he's saying God who in times past spoke to us by prophets, through prophets giving dreams and visions and these kinds of things, has spoken to us in these last days by his son who is not just another prophet. He's not just another prophet. He's God. He is God. He is the exact likeness of his Father. He being the brightness of his glory and express image of his person, upholding all things by the power, word of his power, when he had himself purged our sins, sat down at the right hand of majesty on high. Jesus is God. He is almighty God. He's the creator. He is the, he is the one. And that's what he's saying to these Hebrew believers. You can't run back to the old things because there's nothing there. Who are you going to run to? You're, if you're running away from Jesus, you're running away from God. You, you can't find salvation outside of Christ right. because he is your salvation. Yes. There's no other name given yes. under heaven whereby we may be saved. Yes. And this is the message that we need to proclaim to the world yes. and even in the church to those yes. who decide, you know, this Christianity thing is not all it's cracked up to be. I think I'll just go back to living life the way I did before. Not so easy. Once you have tasted him, once you have touched the heavenly, the heavenly gifts, once you have 
seeing that Jesus is Lord. It's not so easy to go back to the world and live like you never saw what you saw. Once you've seen, you can't erase what you've seen. You know? And there are lots who have tried. You can go in any bar in America and find people who are running from God. They once walked with God and they're no longer walking with God. And they'll sit on the corner of the bar and they'll tell you. They'll tell you all about Jesus. They'll tell you all, but they're running from him because something didn't come across the way they thought or God didn't deliver or something went bad or somebody hurt them or somebody offended them and they decided to run away from Christianity. Listen, your enemy is not Jesus. Your enemy is not Christianity. You have an enemy. His name is Satan. Yes. He's the devil and he wants to deceive you and me and cause us to run away from Jesus. Right. And to stop serving him. But Paul says to, the apostle says to these Hebrews, before you go running back to Moses and to, to the Old Testament ways, not so fast. Because the things Moses wrote about are talking about Jesus. The pictures of the sacrifices yeah. in the temple, of the lamb being sacrificed, that's just talking about Jesus. Yes. The, the, the things the prophets wrote about, they're talking about Jesus. You can't run from Jesus and find salvation. No. You have to run to him. You have to yeah. walk with him. You have to stay yeah. with him. He is yes, the yes, source he of salvation. Is, he is, is the Lord. source of life. Yes, he he is. is the source of blessing. He is the yes. source that God is speaking to the world through yes. today. Yes. He is God's yes. appointed messenger for today and for the days ahead. Yes. He says, when he had himself purged our sins, Never forget, and I say this to myself, why it is I'm in Christianity, why I'm in the church. I'm in Christ because I was a lost sinner. I'm not in Christ to find my career. I'm not in Christ to be all that I ever, never could be. I'm not in Christ for any of the peripheral things that God blesses us with as a result of walking with him. And he does. He right. blesses us. He, he opens doors for our careers. Yes. He blesses yes. us yes. with gifts yes. and talents. Some of us Jesus. play guitar. Lord. Some of us lay bricks. Lord. Some of us can yeah. fix our heart. And all these things. And God yes. blesses them. Yes. And he uses them to meet our needs. Yes. So that we can work and yes. take care of our families. And bless the church and all those yes. things. Yes. But those are all side issues. Yes. We're in the church because we were lost sinners. We needed a Savior. I was lost. And I was not just lost going nowhere. I was lost going to hell. And Jesus rescued me. So before I run away from Christ and decide to run somewhere else, i got to remind myself, where else am I going to go? Because Peter said the same question to Jesus. Where are we going to go? You alone, Lord, have the words of life. Life. Yes. Life. Yes. Eternal life. Yes. You're the only way to God. You're the only way to heaven. Yes. He's the only way. Someone said that the doorway to heaven is only as wide as one man's shoulders. And that's Jesus. That's the narrow way. Yes. It's the narrow way through Christ, through Jesus. There's no other way. He says here, when he himself purged our sins. He purged my sins. He purged your sins. They're gone. Your sins are gone. Your sins are gone. They've been washed away in the blood of the Lamb. That's why I can lift my hands and worship on Sunday without any guilt because I have turned my sins over to Jesus. I've turned my life over to Christ. He forgiven me. He has washed away the record of my sin. When he himself purged us of our sin, what did he do? He sat down at the right hand yes. of the majesty on high. Oh. Having become so much better than the angels, yes. 
because he has by inheritance obtained a more excellent name than they. Jesus isn't just an angel. There were some people teaching in the, at the time of the world that Jesus was part of a hierarchy of angels. No, he wasn't. He wasn't an angel. He wasn't a created being. There was never been a time when Jesus, the Son, didn't exist. He wasn't called by that name, Jesus, that was given to him when he was born in the, 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 the Bethlehem manger. He was called Jesus, but he has always been the Son. He has always been the Son of God in eternity past. The psalmist wrote, and I asked Angela to read it, Your throne, O God, is forever and ever a scepter of righteousness. Psalm 2. Turn back over there with me. The second psalm. Why do the nations rage and the people plot a vain thing? The kings of the earth set themselves and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against his anointed one. Let us break their bonds in pieces and cast away their cords from us. He who sits in the heavens shall laugh. The Lord shall hold them in derision. Then he shall speak to them in his wrath and distress them in his deep displeasure. Yet I have set my king on my holy hill in Zion. He's saying no matter what the leaders try to do, Pilate, Herod, the Pharisees, the Jewish leaders, they set themselves up in array against the Lord and his anointed. That's Jesus. They set themselves up against him, and they try to put him to death. But God says it doesn't matter. He scoffs, he laughs at them, trying to thwart the plan of God. And he says, I still have installed my son, my king, in Zion. That's a picture of Jesus stepping into the throne of David, the king. The one who was prophesied to come. Jesus is the heir that was to come. Jesus is the son that was to come. He is God in the flesh. He is the one. There's no one else to turn to. There's no one else for me to turn to. When he had purged our sins, sat down at the right hand of the majesty of the Lord. Having become so much better than the angels, as he has by inheritance obtained a more excellent name than they. Now, when you speak of the name of Jesus, heaven stops and listens. When I pray in the name of Jesus, heaven hears me. When I preach and proclaim in the name of Jesus, Demons have set us to trouble yes. at the name of Jesus. Yes. Jesus is the name whereby all men may be saved. It's the name of Jesus that we pray for the sick to be healed. It's in the name of Jesus that we pray and ask God to save our family. It's yes. in the name of Jesus that I dedicate my children to the Lord. Yes. It's in the name yes. of Jesus. Not in the name of this one or that one. In the name of Amen. Jesus Christ of Nazareth. He has been given a name that is more excellent than the name. Not because the five letters have any special power. It's because of the life that name represents what he did, what he accomplished. And we should be excited and dance around because Jesus is my king. He's your king. He lives on the inside of you. He lives on the inside of me. And I'm going to see him soon. I'm going to see him. 
Some of them were all that that you read about, and others were more disappointed than others. But I cannot wait to put my eyes on the Son of God, to set my eyes on the one that angels bow before. That day is coming, saints. We're going to sit in his presence. We're going to bow before the King. We're going to worship him. We're going to adore him. Shut ourselves in with the Lord this morning. He is worthy to be praised. We worship you today, Jesus. spoken in times past has in these last days spoken to us by his son. Jesus, you are the messenger. You are God's answer. You are the word of the Lord. The word says that the spirit of Christ is the spirit of prophecy. This gospel, this good news, Lord, you have given us and entrusted us to proclaim to people Lord, it is the message that changes lives. Yes. God, we call on you today. Jesus, we exalt you today. We love you today. We give you praise in your house today. Praise you, Jesus. You are worthy. You are worthy. 